the good old days, right? The good old days when things were simpler. Back in the, uh, back in the day, as they say, in yeah, prehistoric times, <laughs> when the yeah, threat of AI it's... was not looming, and we didn't have to worry about fake news and electioneering, things like that, social media. There a uh, radio hit some electioneering. I believe so. Yes, I believe so. Speaking of, can we just can we just do a sh- what are you drinking a beer there? You, you look like a lumberjack drinking a beer. You going going camping? Can can dry. <laughs> nobody knows what's inside that can, Cormac. Just like just like nobody, nobody knows, knows what's inside right. this. No one knows exactly. what's inside this mug. Your Irish coffee. Cheers, my friend. Cheers. So, can we just I let, do you have any recommendations for the audience of cool things that you've listened to or seen lately because I do. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, you've turned me on to a podcast that is amazing. Oh, now so I've good. only listened to the first episode. I'm lis- I'm I on episode 10. Ten. I'm a little, I'm I a little have, ahead of you. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a lot of catching up to do. I've listened to it. I think now three times because I've wanted other people to listen to it while I'm listening to it with like them. family Again. members or, or yeah, what are you talking yeah. about? Okay. Yeah. yeah, mostly my wife, my daughter, two separate times, two separate drives. I was like, oh, you got to listen to this. Okay, so yeah. so let's say what it is. But but then my question for you after that, so I don't forget, is, is there any appreciation for what you're sharing with them? Because in my family, there's not <laughs> with with that band in particular. <laughs> we're, we're all fans, so. Nice. Well, you've maybe, done something right. Maybe, sir. well. With my daughter, definitely a fan. With my wife, there's an appreciation. And but she wouldn't so, just turn it on. She wouldn't just turn it on to listen. She to would. It. She's not. She, yeah. There are certain songs. So like all of my kids like radio hit, and so they're okay with like listening to greatest hits and things like that. I don't know if any of them agree that like say, okay, computer. In my opinion, and I've shared it with you often is probably one of the most complete albums ever made because I don't think that there's a bad song on that album. Even the, my wife looks at me when the fitter, like that song comes on. The computer voice, the old Apple IIe. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I I had that program and that was amazing when I was a kid. What? She's like, what is that? I'm like, listen to it. It's amazing. I was just like, I was like, I like how you just disqualify. You're like, you're like, like, I don't, I don't have a real answer for you. (laughs) I don't have a real answer other than it's like when somebody asks me architecturally, well, why do you like that? Like, I just do. Yeah. I like it. It is subjective as they say. So, so the podcast is, I mean, we've, we've buried the lead long enough. The podcast is dissect by it's a Spotify and ringer podcast. And there is a series of episodes in season 11 that go deep into analysis of Radiohead's In Rainbows album. So if you are in any way interested in kind of behind the scenes, how they made this kind of things, and if you're a Radiohead fan, and even if you're not, I think there's some incredible musical appreciation to be had here uh, because it does go very, very deep. And obviously there is a yeah. lot of interpretation happening here, but I think that is exactly what Radiohead wants people to do it's is to kind of their intention. widely interpret their music, especially I think it was in episode nine and it's gone now from my queue. So I can't look back at it at the moment, but something that they talk about is just how you, you actually cannot like, like for an, for an artist to prescribe how something should be interpreted it no longer is art art actually happens at the point at which somebody experiences the art that's that the, is where the magic happens right. and so that is very personal at that point the old adage of beauty is in the eye of the beholder is mm-hmm. applicable to so many different things and and the reason why i can't express in like i could dissect which is exactly just the name of the the podcast which is the name of the podcast i could dissect why i personally feel certain architecture certain art certain music appeal to me 
And it doesn't mean that this is the formula on why you should like it. It's the formula on if somebody wanted me to quantify the emotional, visceral reaction that I have for something, Mm -hmm. then I have to sit back and really kind of analyze it and figure out, okay, why, why does it create this kind of emotion with me? Why can't I sit and enjoy punk instead of heavy metal, those kind of things. And so to dissect them, it's only Mm -hmm. for me to appreciate, you know, to kind of like explain to myself why I like it. And maybe if somebody asks me, okay, give me an educated response to it other than, well, I don't know, because. Well, (laughs) well, okay. So, so there, there are two sides to that coin. There, there is just the emotional response that you have could be any range of things. It could be good to bad, Mm -hmm. right? And then there is this analysis, this deeper analysis. And I would argue that you don't have to do the deeper analysis part or even the self-reflection part to to understand. You you don't need to understand why you're having the response that you're having. I mean, I think that there you just it is intuitive you just know it <laughs> and to to your point earlier th- there it's just awesome or you know your response to your wife when she's talking about okay computer and and it's yeah. doing the fitter happier more productive thing is like what yeah. why would and, and and it's like it's because and it's she's... awesome and, and for you yes and for yeah. somebody else equally no right and yeah, like, and i think hell? that's <laughs> and, and so like these the the breakdowns that 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 what's his name i think it's cole does of the songs on this album are like doing case study projects when we Mm -hmm. were in school Mm -hmm. it is a very deep level of analysis of potential intentions but also this very much is in line with something we've talked about on the show before which is rick beato's youtube channel his series about what makes this song great where he actually breaks down and mutes several of the tracks so you can hear the one specific thing and then talks about you know the theory behind that even if the artist doesn't know the theory behind it and but he still talks about it from why it works point of view and i appreciate that because it gives me a deeper appreciation for the thing just like when we were doing case study projects in school and Mm -hmm. i pick a craig elwood project or i pick a schindler project or i pick a lautner project and i am afforded the time to do the deep study Right to right. truly understand, or at least better understand. I guess I shouldn't say truly understand because I don't. Um, just better understand what actually happened throughout the process of that project. But it's a understanding for you to just kind of like quantify why you like something, mm-hmm. and it may have absolutely nothing to do with, say, Lautner or Schindler on why they did it or why Radiohead did what they did. It could be something that is like, why does this speak to me? Or why does this repulse me? Yeah. You know, because I, I I mean, I I agree with that because something there, there's a direct quote from Tom of late singer of Radiohead in, I think it was an interview, but he basically says, once the song's done, it has nothing to do with me anymore. And I find that so insightful because yeah. now it's all about you, the listener. It's all about mm-hmm. how you interpret it. You like, it, I always find it interesting when people ask artists the intentions behind the song, in this case, in, in music. <laughs> yeah. and, and they're yeah. like, and, and I love it when they say, I don't know, what do you think? Because they don't try to answer the question. And this is something that comes up all the time in architecture, which is architects are expected to know the answers to things. And it is rare that that we actually raise our hand and say, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Let me come back to you with that. We, we come up with some BS thing on the spot, or maybe it, maybe it's correct on the spot, but there's still this real desire to answer questions in real time. And I love the whole thing about what do you think? (laughs) It's like, why did you put the entrance here? Or why didn't you do this there? Or in, Mm. there's a lot of times where in our mind, and maybe it's just me and I doubt it is but that it's, well, it just felt right. It felt mm-hmm. right that that mm-hmm. should be there and not there. And there's but, a lot of people that answer doesn't work for them. Right? Exactly. And, and that's the problem. And so then we have to say, well, and then that's where we like, you just 
come in with our Arcus Beak dribble and it's just like, well, you know, I was looking at the we juxtaposition <laughs> of, and we just like <laughs> babble some crap on of Maybe. this is yeah. why it meant what it meant and why the move did. Because you're right. There are people who just, when I sit and draw and they're like, well, why did you draw that? I'm like, just, it's what I wanted to draw at the time. Well, and part of it is is all of the experience that you've gained up to that point and your particular mm -hmm. experience that you've had as a human and what's in your DNA and what receptors you have brought your environment into and, and encapsulated that in your body that then works its way back out during the creative process. And right, right. How, how do you explain that? I mean, it, that's a very difficult thing to explain. And so it just felt right. I, people understand that, but they may not be satisfied with that. There are... so. Going through the process of design, I mean, we take both analytical and intuitive approaches simultaneously, right? Because there are things that we have to do. There are boxes that we have to check. There are elements. There are hard constraints. Program, there are hard constraints that we have to do. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then there's the what to us makes why we did what we did right or feel like arrange it the way we did or there are things where we can quantify and use the analytical side of things and say, this is why we did what we did. But then there's those certain moves or there's just certain aspects of design where we're just like, it just felt right. Yeah. You know, and, and right. we can't, we can like back it off and before those people who don't think that because it just felt right is the, the right response. You, you have enough, especially with us, we you just said it. Is like, you know, I have enough experience. I have enough knowledge that I've gained throughout all of my years that can basically tell me to, oh, here's how you can quantify the response of like why you did what you did. It doesn't necessarily mean that was the rationale of behind what I did is how I did what I did. It was, I did what I did because it felt right, but here is a way for you to understand the feeling behind what I did. Yeah. It reminds yeah. me of the old uh, Frank Gehry quote, and I know it's polarizing. And so it's, even if I say <laughs> Frank's name, I think some people are like, ah, whatever. But he said something to the tune of, why would somebody hire me and then tell me what to do? Right. I'm paraphrasing yeah. there, I'm sure. Yeah. No. It's but quite... it's similar to that, right? It's like, mm -hmm. you hired me because I'm the expert. And then it's like somebody, it's like a client saying, you saying to a client, here's the price for this thing. And they'll say, well, I want you to itemize that. It's like, what are you talking about? I, this it, is how much exactly. it costs, right? This right, is this right. is what it costs. And it's like all of the things wrapped up in you as an individual and what you bring and the value that you bring is very difficult and kind of just pointless to itemize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet people ask for that all the time. I think that all is- the time. Yeah. Especially when you're working for government officials or some bean counters, of bean counters who are just like, apologies to okay, the bean counters. You have, right you have given us a, you've given us an estimate of how long it's going to take and how much it's going to take and all of that other stuff. However, I want and I, I want you to tell me step by step what you're going to do and why are you charging this? And you're like, it's the process. Like, yeah. Sometimes the process is quantifiable and sometimes the process isn't. But it, it all really just depends on... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we're going exploring and we don't know where we're going to end up. Yes, that happens for sure. Yeah. I mean, even when you go on a site walk and you have what seems like a clear process. We are talking in the last episode about my new project on Liberty Island and we had a clear understanding from their scope is this is what we feel like it entails. But then we also were on the site walk looking at potential scope creep and things like that that are necessary to facilitate the work. Well, there's In, the preconceived idea from their yeah, side only exactly. about what the project is. And then right. you add a bunch of architects to the conversation and you start to say, what if, and oh, but, and, and, and there's this, and, and the equation literally changes throughout the conversation. And we were walking around with all of these national parks folks that are also equally educated in both architecture, engineering, and, and everything else. And again, they're scoping it based off of certain needs for the building. 
But then as you start walking around and here I am that have some expertise in adaptive reuse as well as preservation, but more so looking at it from, and when there was the conversation about what about life safety as well. And here I am on, and what just open up, it's that, open up that can of worms there of going through and having that conversation about now you have this, now you have that, now you have this. And so now that, that here's the list, how it started and here's the list now. And it literally, there's this big, yeah. massive list that is, has changed and now it's the reanalyzing re our scope and reanalyzing fees and reanalyzing this and that and everything else, because it's that, as you just said, exploration. It's a process. I mean, and that's it's, the thing is it, it's not a math equation. And that is the difference between, uh, well, I'll just say that's what design is. That, just, that is right. the design process, yeah. right? right. It, it is a, the difference between a wicked problem and a tame problem. A tame mm -hmm. problem is literally math. There is one answer. Yeah. We know where we're right. going. We know exactly how we're going to get there. This design is a wicked problem by definition right. because oh, yeah, you yeah. don't know necessarily where you're going until you get to a point and then you can figure <laughs> out how you're going to get right. there. But right. at right. the beginning, you don't know where you're going. And I think that it is very interesting to try to communicate that to people who don't go through that process for us it's normal and mm -hmm. there's even like this we have this thing about us where we just because it is so normal it is difficult to put other people put ourselves in other people's shoes of not experiencing that very often and so we just have this right, expectation right. like we all get this and we don't like the royal the we doesn't get this and so there is like a level of communication and education that has to yeah. be done to facilitate that understanding. Right. Because like, if you are a very analytical right brain, you, if you are a bean counter, if you are <laughs> there, it's like that just doesn't happen. It doesn't, right. that's not how things happen. And so it's really foreign. And so to go on a site walk with program managers, facilitators of project processes and all, mm -hmm. all of those kinds of things, it's, it is a, kind of a rude awakening to under to go through that process and experience yeah. although it is really rewarding i think for those people too after the fact i think up front it's like nerve-wracking it's like nail biting oh, yeah. oh crap because they can just see the dollar signs adding that, up that they were not accounting for ahead of time i saw probably the that expression you can tell the oh crap expression on somebody's face when they're thinking as I'm identifying issue after issue after issue, that wasn't things that were viewed or expected or anticipated within the project brief that have now expanded the project brief. And so you can just as a, oh, and this doesn't meet coder, but you see how this is a, a separation wall, but you've got all these penetrations through it. And you're just like talking about all these like little nuances of things that you things see. That people never see people, and, things that yeah, people right. never see or think right. about because they're behind right. <laughs> the literal curtain of some, exactly. some surface. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And so then when you like, and then they're like, oh, 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 like, and the know. best clients are the ones where you get somewhere into the project and they say, we have contingency budget because we knew we wouldn't foresee everything up front. Right. Especially with a renovation of yeah. the level that you're talking about on this exactly. project, right? Where the yes. building is yeah. really old and it has been through many interventions many. over the years exactly. to change it and modify it. And it's like one of those things where how could you, how could you understand the full scope of the project? I, I hope you have a client like that. I don't. Yeah. Oh no, no, it's they, they're, they, they, we knew from day one, sitting down in our debrief on Ellis Island, which. You, you just like cool. to throw that out there. Exactly. Yeah. Sweet flex right there. Uh, exactly. We were sitting there in the debrief and we're going through everything. They, they were very receptive to listening to all of the things that we saw and, and saying, okay, identifying, okay, we need that. We need that. We need that. Oh, we don't really necessarily need that. Maybe we need that. Let's investigate that a little bit more and so on and so forth. So it was just like, they were open to it and they were just like, okay, well, this is the stuff that we need to add to the project brief. These are the things that as part of this phase, that's essentially the phase that we're telling them is like, okay, we've seen what you wanted. 
Now we've seen the building. And now we understand Those what two you things really do not is. add up. Exactly. And now exactly. we're going to come up with a integrated it's, plan. And it's, <laughs> it's like, now we understand what you really need. And here's what right. we suggest. And then from there, then we get, move forward with, okay, to implement all of these, it's going to cost X, Y, or Z. We were expecting X. Now you're saying it's Z. Do we have the budget for Z? Do we need no, to go to No, it's going to be Y.368. I was going to say, or does it need to be Y.5? Yeah. So so this is, it, it's really interesting because why don't, especially with projects of this nature, this stature, I don't mm. know what the right way to say that is, why don't they, why don't they engage an architect early, earlier than the RFP to actually identify well, these things beforehand because well, this, that to me honestly, seems like the right scope uh, or the right the right process on, to go honestly, through. Honestly, this is that process. So they've identified the right people to help them identify the right scope. And mm, so that okay. is actually this pre-designed process. So rescoping um, is it was this expected. this is <laughs> this is actually the intention of this particular process that we're on is interesting. Okay. This is what we thought it was. You see something differently. Tell us what you see. Give us that. I just menu. wonder with a government agency how much time was spent on the this is what we thought process. <laughs> I can't <laughs> answer it's that. The one. government, yeah. right? I, I don't can't expect you that. to know the answer, but man, I want. I'd love to know how much. But as, time but as, and money was spent on that. But as somebody who was in the army and saw those kind of thought processes. Yeah. It, a lot. <laughs> yeah, a lot. And a the answer lot. is a lot. So how much of it is balancing the, okay, so you're coming up with a new revised, very Project additional brief. checklist. Yes, <laughs> right? yes. There are very, lots yeah. of things that were not on no, the list no, are no going onto the list. Yeah, no subtractions, all How adds. much of that is balanced with, because that could be, I could imagine, uh, of really... Um, nail biting to reiterate what I said earlier, mm -hmm. kind of nail biting, anxious process for someone to go through like big eyes. What do you mean? It's that bad. What? And, and so how much of your time is spent balancing that kind of talk with it's going to be okay. Right. Because oh, yeah, we're yeah. going to figure that. I mean, this is, I think the we, thing that I, I saw a video recently on Instagram where somebody, or maybe it was YouTube, and they, they were just going around with their microphone and saying, hey, what do architects do to random people on the street, uh, right? Yeah. And yeah, and the there's no good answer that comes out of that because, yeah. because we suck at telling people the value of architecture or architects. And so the, the one of the answers that I saw was they spend all the money on projects. Yeah. And, and I think that is a legitimate concern. Right. Because I mean, that's true. Yeah. If you give us a budget our like, we're, we're not trying well, to spend it, it all, but we're pretty, I mean, it's, I don't know the right way to say this, though, but it's, right? it is like, this is how much we're going to because spend it's like, because, because the want wants this. are always more than the budget. Right. And so it's like, right. well, we're going to spend all the budget to, to give you close to the compromised exactly. version of what you want. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm literally working on that for another project that. They have a wish list of everything that they want. Well, enter in a couple of other levels of bureaucracy that are asking for other things. And so mm -hmm. now we're basically saying what our value is being able to discern, okay, if you want all of this is either what you have to sacrifice mm -hmm. or rethink its basically size or number. Like if you have X amount of rooms that you want, but... You don't have, you, right now you're starting at zero and you want five. Do you need five to accommodate some of the other things? You're going to need to do this or this and come up with that menu of, okay, there is endless possibilities of what you can and can't do. You know that your budget is this fixed, not moving, not changing. I'm also going to tell you that your square footage available is fixed and not changing, not moving. And so there's just so much that you can fit into that bag. And mm -hmm. here are the options of what you can. You can either go all in on this program, all in on this program, or if you do the mix of the two programs, which is what they're asking for right now, 
I have to tell them what is that best mix and how to get there. And so, and yeah, and it's, it's just, it's a crazy process that we're going through right now because they don't know what they really need, but they also know that they want more than what we can give them. Almost always. Yeah. Almost, almost always. always. Yeah. Not always, but almost always. Yeah. And I think what's, so back to my question about like how much of your conversation is, we've got this. Yeah. It's going to be okay. Like we're going to come to this decision mm -hmm. of, because you, you have to reconcile, right? Like, but yeah. we're going to do that together. It's, and, and so my point about bringing up the, the YouTube thing was like, no, architects just don't like take it and run with it. It's not their money, right? right? It's, it's not their right. project. That so, was the point of me bringing this up is it's like, we, yeah, we do spend all of the money, but we spend the money in the wisest way possible to achieve what you are, some resemblance, yeah, some resemblance of the outcome that you're desiring, right? And I think yeah. in some cases you deliver more than they were Right. ever could have hoped for or dreamed of or expected and in yeah. some cases less I, I and and that is the balance that like, oh, and they, man, these are difficult really for, conversations yeah. to have but i mean they they exactly. have to happen and so this is why you come to this show this is why you listen yeah. to arca speak because you get i will say i just want to say yeah, like yeah, we, we watch yeah, these yeah, yeah. videos on youtube about yeah. the amazing projects and we see what gets published in the magazine and no one ever talks about this stuff it's right. always like a blank slate project and an enormous, undulating, gorgeous site overlooking the ocean, yeah. and we could do whatever we wanted. And the, um, there was no budgetary like it was. It's obvious there was no budgetary limit on this. It was just like, and you don't hear this part of the story. But this is how did I don't even know how we got here talking about a, a podcast <laughs> about Radiohead. But that's how these conversations go. But the, I mean, it's Always. I think there's so much insight in this conversation. And I'm not trying to toot our own horns. But this is this is what it's really like to be an architect. Right. Oh, yeah. And yeah. hold a client's hand throughout the entire process to figure this stuff out together and include them in that process. Because right. it's not black or white. It's not one side or the other. It's everybody together. And never at any point in time, or at least in my experience, do we ever go into this process where the client is completely left out in the cold and doesn't understand. Like we never shocked, shocked yeah. that you did that. Right. Like, oh my gosh. It's just like, no, no, we talked about this. And if you recall. <laughs> now that does want... happen right there. Nah, but I. Yeah. That does happen. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, were we in different meetings at the same time? <laughs> how did we come to this different understanding I of what know. was going to yeah. happen? I don't know yeah. how many times the, in the back of my head, not necessarily coming out of my mouth because that's just unprofessional. <laughs> You're not going to remember this in the future. It's just, <laughs> it, it's just this. We've talked about this. You knew exactly right. what you were asking for and what you were asking me to do. And I got as close as I could and we didn't get in. And I told you the challenges to get there. And or now, what you directed it, us to do. Or, and now you're yeah, throwing exactly. us under the bus for some mistake that we well, advised then, against. <laughs> well, then we, then we might as well go ahead and say that not only is that those conversations really important to have with them, but also the documentation of those com conversations. Meeting I remember pro are, practice class. In school, and our instructor, Michael Falonis, architect in Santa Monica, California, he uh, he would like drill this into us. And I thought, man, it just it's that just su seems like such a sucky, sucky position to be in, <laughs> to be the one who is like taking the notes, writing everything down, communicate the way you communicate, how you document your communications, your yeah. conversations, all these things. And I was like, man, that just doesn't sound like being an architect. That exactly. sounds like a court reporter. Yeah. And right. that, that to me sounded, and, and there are so many people who practice architecture who do not do this, right? And they take on that liability by mm -hmm. not doing it. And that is, reminds me of the comment that I had with one of my interns and when we were I took them out onto the construction site and they sat with me all day long during a, a owner architect contractor meeting OAC for those who like acronyms for those who know 
And, and they were just like, man, I didn't realize how much management architecture was I'm like, that is all it really Unfortunately. is. Unfortunately. And, and, and the thing is, is that it's- We were taught it was design. Yeah. But it's management of the design. It's management of the yeah. documentation. It is a management well, it's of- how you of get like something built. Is, yeah, exactly. It, yeah. It's how the thing becomes realized. If you, if that, you Because want, if it's just on paper, it's never going to be yeah. architecture. If you want that design to be what you had in your head, you have to manage not only expectations, but the reality of how to achieve it. So management, yes. I mean, it's still design. And if you truly make it like a part of like your standard daily practice of, I say manage and design interchangeably because you can design the process, you can manage the process. It's just how you go about doing it, how you go about seeing it. So you can design yourself a set of meeting minutes, which protect you and them in under setting the expectations and meeting all of the project goals and all that other stuff. Or you can manage yourself a set of meeting minutes. And so, and it, it's the exact same answer. So however you want to yeah. say it, management or design, it's still the, it is the controlling of the process. I think you just said that controlling of the process to make sure that what both you and they expect actually happens at the end so that when yeah, you literally do not want to throw it over the fence and exactly. just say you've got it from here yeah yeah <laughs> i guarantee you you won't get what you want if you do that it's i'll just Be say it's very difficult yeah. to get what you want if you Be do that yeah. because those people who answered the to the architects what does an architect do they spend the money yes we do because that's what we're hired for but we're hired for a very specific reason of how to spend that money of how to spend that money. We don't actually spend the money. We give a guideline of how to spend it. I thought it was so interesting that of the answers that I did see, none of them were like, they create the buildings we spend 90% of our day in. It was like, right, right. they sketch in their little sketchbooks yeah, and they spend all the money right. and they, 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 they work in 3D and, and it was, it's not, it wasn't like they craft the built environment. Mm -hmm. I think, if there's a clue in the answers that we saw there and, and so kind of going back to this case study idea now i'm starting to put things together here right <laughs> live on the spot but why don't we do more deep dives into what the design process is and put it out on display i don't know if people would actually watch or listen to that but i i kind of there you know, architects would, but they don't count, yeah. right? We're not, we don't need to keep this inside the echo chamber, right. but, but, but making, I mean, on some level, I mean, this is where to much to our chagrin, like HGTV and these shows have come in to do that on our behalf in a very poor way, right? Which is right. really, really fake well, the design process, right? And give people yeah. incredibly wrong expectations. But it they seems to me like... Because like going back to this Radiohead example, right, that with the Dissect podcast, they do this deep dive. They don't ever talk about how long it actually took to do this. And in some, right. well, I, I take that back. In some cases, they do. This, there are, they'll say there are breadcrumbs of this song going back to this date. And it, it's like a decade, right, mm -hmm. where it's like they took 10 years to figure this song out. They didn't work on that one song for full time for 10 years. Right. But it took that long for, the, for it to gel. And to, for them to figure out all the parts that ultimately got recorded, that ultimately got put onto the album and what they deemed as good enough to release, right? Like that to them, it was, they, they figured it, they cracked it and they put right. that out there when it comes to architecture, right? Like we, we, they tell this HGTV tells this fictional story about how long it takes to do everything. And so it, again, it, it comes back to us and what we're willing to do but to show people the process and how long it takes and why it takes that long and how you spend the money and all those kinds of things. The thing that I find so disingenuous about HGTV, and we've talked about this, is the this process that they show where they meet with the client, right? And then the next day they show up with a set of fully rendered plans. Fully and, permitted plans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just like, and we're ready to start building tomorrow. Actually, and, they don't even show like, the plans. It's just a SketchUp yeah, model. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. It's just like, wait, <laughs> but there's this long process in between point A and point B that you forgot. 
And to the keen eye, you would look at it, you would say, wait, when they met with the client the first time, they were wearing shorts and it was sunny outside and all the trees were green. And now they come back (laughs) the next day and And it's winter (laughs) and it's winter time and it's snow on the ground and everything else. Whereas that's why I personally love, and I've said this countless times, where I love this old house because this old house, an entire season of this old Mm -hmm. house is dedicated to one old house, maybe two old houses, but it's still, it's the whole process. And you see that it's multiple seasons and we're about to finish up the 18th month of our project. And they say the timeline for people to realize that it is not a fly by night. It is not a, what was that show where they like did everything in a weekend. And then when they went away, things started to like peel off the walls and all that other crap. You hear the horror stories of like the after effects of HGTV, but not the end. So yeah. Everybody gets caught up in that kind of shiny object syndrome part of it. And the problem is that people believe that so much that they say, well, you want to believe it. Why does it take you so long when it takes HGTV a weekend to do this? Like, uh, because... It's not the real. Magic of television production. Yeah, exactly. There, there's a show on Netflix uh, by called Dream Home Makeover with mm. Studio McGee. Is kind of the, there's there's Shay and Sid. They're a married couple, and they basically built this. They started out as like an interior design studio that turned into an empire. <laughs> and I think there's a ton of insight in the show. And one thing I really appreciate about them because it's that style of show where they do an extreme makeover to. Right a home or whatever or a p- or part of a home mm-hmm. they're really honest about i think they're honest i should say <laughs> I'm not con- it's three months later four months later it's like it, when they first met with them and then when they go back and start demo and they will put it on the screen and i assume that's because they're a legitimate design studio who's looking for p- great projects to work on And they don't want to set unrealistic expectations from people coming to them from this Netflix show, which I assume is a great sales leader for them, right? It's like, I've seen your work. It's amazing. I want you to do my my project. I want you to do my $20 million renovation on my home that's up in Park City, Utah. But it's one of those things where it's like they are... I think, I, like I said, honest about the timelines that they present. And you don't see the whole timeline, but you, but the pieces that they put in there, again, they're editing this thing down to a 30-minute show or whatever. Right, right. That, that's an entire pro- project process. And so there are some labels that show up on the screen, and, and I, I appreciate that. At least somebody's trying to do something about that. That's what I love about the car shows that we watch and stuff, too. It's because... They're pretty legit. It's just now we're coming to the close of a two and a half year build, or this has been a 10 year build kind of thing. And you're just like, wait, I just watched 10 years in in 60 <laughs> minutes. Well, and there's other projects going on, right? right. I, like this is something that right. nobody talks about, right? Studio McGee is doing 20 projects at once. The car guy is doing 10 cars at the Which same you, time. And they're you know, jumping like, from project to project. Right. You like watch bitch and rides and they pan across the shop and the shop has got 30, 40 cars all yeah. in s- various states of completeness of tear down of like complete rebuild and all this other stuff. And none of them try to deceive you by saying, oh yeah, you see this completely rusted out quarter panel. Yeah. We can get that knocked out in 10 minutes to be completely, <laughs> completely replace this quarter panel with a brand new one. It's just like, no, it takes time to do all of this stuff and you craft through it all. And going back to the process, people, HGTV does the start and then the finish with kind of like this blur in between of like the process without legitimizing how long it really takes. And, and so that's when people have those unrealistic expectations of why is it, Evan, you're telling me that it's going to take you. X amount of months to do this design work. Why? Well, why does it take you so long? And my contractor's telling me that it's going to take 18 months. Why is it going to take 18 months once you get the document? So, so now you're saying that this custom home is going to take two to three years to do? Like, yes. <laughs> because you forgot the custom home part. You forgot the the process of things. You forgot the months that it takes to just permit something. You forgot the, 
oh, sometimes you can't build in the ground when it's frozen. <laughs> those those simple yeah. little things. Right. All of the behind the scenes stuff that gets kind yeah. of, well, I mean, we want to forget about that stuff too. And, we and, we want to show the the picture at the end as well, right? And <laughs> so our job is to dissect the process. Ooh, look See? at you. So we're, are we going to do that or what? I don't <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the royal we architects this is your job right Which well to... when, so, when somebody asks us quantify your fees we have to dissect our fees or you know, maybe you don't we I, have to I mean, dissect I get, I the think process that, yeah I, yeah i mean i mean mm, i know do you need I, to justify do you need to justify everything i don't well it, it all depends like when nobody goes to the car dealer and says well that volvo right there please give me a line item breakdown of all the yeah nobody does that it's like why why does that cost fifty thousand dollars when i know that i could go to rock auto and basically get every single part on here for 30 percent to 50 percent less you should definitely do that you should do that yeah you should put that car together by yourself uh, <laughs> <laughs> and don't do it well, out of order because you're just going to have to undo it. As you, since my air conditioning just went up, my practically brand new vehicle, and I get a quote. Out of warranty, practically vent, brand no, new vehicle. No, my, out, throw my, that out there. Not the practically out of warranty, out of warranty because somebody likes to drive <laughs> way too much that <laughs> the three years, 36,000 mile warranty was up in one year. Ouch. And then the Ouch. six year, 60,000 or whatever it was the next one since after two years i'm at seventy thousand, seventy five thousand miles yeah oh my god yeah i know but get out of the car man get out of I, the car i do i drive to places <laughs> so i can get out of the car <laughs> but i have to get to the places where but i, I want to get out to, of the car <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> and those happen to be very far away <laughs> i looked at their price breakdown and i'm like are you seriously telling me that an evaporator coil is $700? And I look up on the Mopar website and yes, Mopar is charging for the, ex for the, that for $700. For that part. You go to wow. Rock Auto for the exact same part, exact same number, $300. So why? are you, why? So which architect are you? Which architect are you? <laughs> are you the rock architect? I've been architect? both. <laughs> or are you the Mopar architect? <laughs> well, we've been both. You're the Y.368. You're, you're, yeah, you're exactly. somewhere in between. <laughs> we've been both because you work for public works projects. You work for public schools projects. And you have to be that. Well, I can find the exact same thing on Rock Auto for $300 when you're trying to charge me for that. Because if you want that design... You better find it a hell of a lot cheaper because you, they can't afford the markup. This is like the, uh, <laughs> there's that YouTube channel where these kids build replicas of cars out of wood. Have you seen this? Yes. It's like, I think yeah, it's yeah, yeah. in the Philippines or something where it's, and they're incredible. Oh, yeah. But it's like, that those are the differences in the architects. Like you can get the real car yeah. or you can get the wood, the wooden version of the car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving him the tinfoil version, not the the, the, the tinfoil, not the stainless steel version. Yeah. Exactly. They want stainless <laughs> they steel. I give from them three hundred feet away. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just don't push on it. Yeah. Don't touch it. Don't do the oil canning. Yeah. So. All right. Wow. That's a that's a lot to talk about from a podcast about. Um, yeah, so radio. we'll put a link to that in the show notes. I mean, I think, I think again, if you enjoy the Radiohead, if you do not enjoy the Radiohead, but you still appreciate music and a deep dive into kind of the inner workings of yeah. what sounds like a pretty tortured process to create what many would call their magnum opus of an, al of an album, their masterpiece, I think it's worth a listen. So in your opinion, which I, I already said, okay, computer is... I like that's your that's your pick. Well, I, I, so what I appreciate is something you actually said earlier on, which was an album, a complete cat, a thing beginning to end, not yeah. just songs. Right. Which is like, which is what Napster and then iTunes basically did to change the music industry yes. for better or worse. Right. right. Uh, and I think right. uh, we've all been 
in the situation where we don't want the whole album. We just want that one song. But these really are crafted. And there's many examples of this. I mean, look mm-hmm. at an ELO or, a, you know, a Beatles album or there, there's so many where it's like the whole album is the complete work. And it yes. is a set yeah. of songs in a particular order. And it's not just pick and choose. Right. Yeah. And so this is to me, this is their magnum opus. It is in rainbows. Yeah. Yeah, like <laughs> I, I have nothing against OK Computer, to be clear. But <laughs> yeah, you'd be wrong. I would love to hear this deep dive of OK Computer next. Oh, like, I would ab- get, absolutely love to have him get to work, that dissect that podcast. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, and honestly, I would love for them to tackle not the extended um, iTunes version of it, but the actual original album mm-hmm. of Depeche Mode Violator, which again is another one of those, in my opinion, complete albums because. Every song hit. To just they, they... I'll, I'll throw another one in the ring. Siamese Dream by Smashing Pumpkins. There you go. I, again, like I just a, an amazing, complete. Yes. Right, we're speaking to our our upbringings here. This we, is we are, we, our we formative are. years. We are, we are. I mean, because there's <laughs> sorry there's, youngsters. There's, sorry, there's not some, sorry. It's just like when they release like a single, and you're like, oh yeah, that single's great. And so you rush out and you buy the album, and you're like. Okay, the single was great, but the album wasn't. Or the album was okay, but not great. There's a reason why there's B-sides of things. Because they're like, eh, maybe that's Well, okay, what I appreciate this. about this deep dive is that there is, there's a song, I, I can't remember if it was The Reckoner, I think, in the middle. It's, it's really interesting why that song is right there in the <laughs> album. And it is, an, it is a song that standalone to kind of prove the point that we were just talking about, where this is a collection of songs in an album that is meant to be listened to from beginning to end, makes total sense in that context. Out of that context, you might just pass it by. Right. And I think that's super interesting about this. Like, this is the difference between appreciating the work for what it is versus kind of the consumerism version of it, which is pick and choose my favorites and make a playlist, a conglomeration of a bunch of different artists with their greatest hits or whatever. Right. That's why we make, we made mixtapes back in the day is because we were like, okay, we we did make our own versions of this. Exactly. (laughs) I, I don't necessarily appreciate the whole thing, but here are songs of that, that create that same vibe, that same flow, that same kind of like feeling. And here's how we put them together. And here's the right order for us, again, the appreciator for us on how, how things go together. And now like when, when I'm sitting here listening to some of my music, the music I grew up with, but I'm listening to it from the aspect of my kids who create playlists and I'm expecting, cause I already know what the next song is, but the next song is not there because they have it on shuffle. Or they have it on this. You're like, oh, it's just, that's the you wrong. screwed it up on shuffle. I was like, man, that is the wrong song to come next. <laughs> yeah. Or you're used to listening to an album and you know that how this song leads into the next one. Exactly. And you've got to hear that next song. Like, exactly. It, like it's not complete if you don't. So, okay. So bigger than just this album, I think what is so important about it for me, which makes it my pick, is that how they released it was mm-hmm. huge. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was, So with, that, if people are not familiar with how In Rainbows was released, they had completed and then detached from their contract with EMI Records. And this record was released by the band on their website. And I remember going to the website when this album came out. Yeah. And it said something to the tune of like, you name the price. How much do you want to spend on the album? And you could put any number in there that you wanted and right. you would get the album. Put and zero. compared to, yeah. you could put one, you could put 10, you could put 50, you could put whatever you wanted. Right. And I thought that was so, like that was mind blowing. You can do that. And they could, they were in a position, they could do whatever they wanted, mm-hmm. right? It was their music. It was their art to give away if they wanted yeah. to charge a lot of money for whatever they wanted. They were not beholden to current industry standards of pricing yeah. for music. And I think one of the big reasons they did it this way is because they did not want to release it song by song. You bought the whole album. Yeah. So if you wanted to pay 99 cents for a song, you were going to get the whole album. 
And I think that was brilliant. How many times have you listened to a song and not care for the album, but you've still listened to it and you've grown appreciation for it over time? Like that happens too, oh, right? Yeah, that happens. Hundred, yeah, all yeah. the time. And, and so I think that this was one of those things where it's, this is how it's meant to be heard and they're right. taking a stand against the establishment mm-hmm. to do something brave. Yeah. Like that was super brave of them to do at the time. And so I think that was that was a big a big deal, which which just plays into my appreciation of this right. album as a, a way of conducting themselves as well. Yeah. They are final uh, recommendation, and I've sent this link to you as well, which is the Basement series, which is a live studio recording of their albums, many many albums out there, but this one in particular, the In Rainbows Basement sessions. So we'll I'll have to put links to all these in the show notes. But if you want to see this music performed in a controlled environment, but one where they actually do all the things. I mean, it's incredible. Absolutely incredible. See, you not only get a chat about architecture, but about music. We're rich, enriching yeah. your soul in every facet. Or not. <laughs> or, or, or maybe you hate it. Yeah. 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 Leave a comment. <laughs> yeah. Please tell us why you're wrong about not appreciating Radiohead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>